Shawty wanna ride for me Say she really vibe with me Good morning, welcome to today's video. I'm over in Camberley today because we're going to a wedding later. In the meantime, I'm heading to Bagshot to meet Ken, the power man, about some power. Thank you for the great response to the last video. You guys want to know more about power? Here it is. It's kicking off in Bagshot today. Hey! Hey! Oh, can I say it? What? Welcome to today's video. I've already done that. <laughs> ah, damn it! <laughs> you're you're, you're like, um, almost normal, and then you almost. have jawbreakers on. <laughs> And I haven't got Krusty the Clown hair anymore. Really? But Can I'm not going to reveal well, it. Why not? No, it's not ready. It's not, <laughs> it's not ready to be unleashed what on the world done? just yet. Oh, nothing. It's normal hair. It's just there's still like there's still side bits oh. that won't Ooh. go in. Uh, but get so, in there. Yeah, it's really close. But I don't think. So you've just revealed be. it anyway. Shit. So I've met up with Ken from BPC. You do coaching. I do coach. He is an expert in power. Thank you for the wonderful response to the last video. Everyone said they wanted to hear some stuff about power from an expert. And here is one. Like, how about that for a turnaround? You even got a laptop. You must be an expert. Oh, you must be an expert. <laughs> I've done spreadsheets, I've got a laptop. There's all gibberish. In, <laughs> Let's get geeky. In I'm not an uber geek. I'm like an eight out of 10 geek. That's pretty like, high. I'm no, I'm no Stephen Hawkins. Like, if you start trying to quiz me on like mathematical formulas and stuff, I'll be like, I don't know. Doesn't but, matter. It needs to. It, it's knowledge that needs to be applied. Yeah, exactly. The th thing is, I I understand all of the concepts to do with power, and most importantly, how to apply them to the real world. And yeah, because you actually do racing yourself. Your, that is your USP. Well, yeah. When it comes to power, you don't want it to just be another number on your Garmin. Yeah. You've got to actually do something with it and understand enough about it for it to impact your cycling and make you quicker. Um, but having a power meter will change your riding for the better. Big time. It is incredible like actually knowing what you're producing in terms of output rather than guessing or looking at speed or put setting Guess your goals definitely. on like distance and speed just like isn't the same as power and duration because there's so many other variables involved you don't actually know if you're getting quicker or not like a 10 mile time trial for example your your speed on the same course or your your finishing time could be up to a minute different for the same power output just because of conditions like wind temperature air density like all sorts of stuff, even with all the same air equipment. Density. Air density. Air density. Around you that lady just gave you a rooster. <laughs> a rooster coffee. What is that? It's got coconut oil and butter. It's good. You're not allowed butter though. I wonder if they do like a margarine. <laughs> Have you shaved your arms? Yes. For the, uh, for the nine man time trial, I gave team orders to all shave your forearms. <laughs> Chris did it. <laughs> yeah, Chris did it. Two of the guys didn't do it, and I was very upset with them. So that's why you came second. So, so this is called Best Bike Split. So it's a tool for predicting time trial performance. Yeah. So when I'm looking at um, what power I need to achieve a certain goal in a time trial, if I've got some uh, some files from my Garmin that I can upload to this, it does a really good job of predicting what I could potentially do in terms of speed and time and all, all of those kind of things. When we were talking about losing weight for cycling versus fueling your training to get fitter if you start to look at that in terms of your actual performance and how it would be affected if you lost weight or gained power then you can see using this how many seconds it would save you or lose you yeah. in a 10 mile time trial shaving arms is like 10 watts well it's not 10 watts it's probably like, it's probably like half a watt <laughs> but if you find 20 half a watts yeah. that's 10 watts I so maybe I can do maths. Can. So, so on this, it knows what power I did, it knows what course I did, and it knows the weather for that day and time that I rode the course. So then it can have a look at what kind of your angles I was experiencing in terms of where the wind is coming from and how uh, much drag I'm producing at each of those your angles. And it can then, from that, say, right, next week on that course on, to, on next week's weather data you'll probably go this fast yeah or if this is how fast you go in these conditions we'll put you on this course and say you'll go this fast and it's remarkably accurate like i did a um i did a time trial 10 mile time trial a couple of weeks ago and it predicted my time to the second like literally to the second it gave me a target wattage number and a plan on when the gradient is this do this wattage yeah or if you're in a headwind section do this wattage so if i were to diet my nuts off for three months i could probably lose four kilograms change my weight from 91 down to what did i say 
down to 87. That saves me two seconds. Crazy. Yeah. So four kilos and three, four months of hard dieting to save two seconds on a time trial. Not, not worth, worth it. it. And it's a balancing act, you'll lose what? Yeah, the, the risk you run from restricting calories the whole time is the quality of your training suffers. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily <coughs> that you lose muscle mass and you lose watts. It's more, you can't recover as well when you're restricting your calories and you can't train with as high a quality and as uh, high an intensity, so your fitness suffers as a result of that. If your goal is to go faster, then aerodynamics should be right near the top of your list, right underneath fitness. It should be fitness, aero, weight. In that, in that order, in yeah. my opinion. Even, even for road racing. I even for road racing. Yeah, yeah. yeah There's like, nothing hilly enough to warrant uh, um, super light. I don't know. It's like the, the steeper the road gets, the more weight has an impact. And the slower the speed, the more weight has an impact. So, yes, on a hilly road race, if you lose three kilos, it's going to make the race feel easier. But if you look at the average speed of the race and the amount of time you're spending above 10, 15 mile an hour, then the accumulative effect of being more aero has a way bigger impact than just weighing a little bit less. I would, I would much rather wear a skin suit and be two kilos heavier than wear a baggy jersey but be really skinny. But I'm never going to be really skinny. So you mentioned something about there being two different types of threshold. Was I right? You are right. There's probably more than two different types of threshold. Everyone's got their own opinion on what the right one is and like how valid they are and the ways of measuring them. It's, it's an absolute minefield. And I, I sympathise with people that are new to it and that are just want to train better because it's so complicated. Um, there's, uh, there's FTP, there's anaerobic threshold, there's maximal lactate steady state, there's critical power. There's like four or five different definitions of what people commonly understand as threshold. Yeah. The biggest mistake that people make is thinking that their 20 minute power is their threshold. Yeah. And what I see is people doing a 20 minute test and then they go, oh, I'll take 95% of the power from that and presume that that's my threshold and that's okay and in general terms for most people that kind of works but it's flawed ever so slightly because it's for the general population and for me my threshold is 92% of my 20 minute power yeah. so if I was to set my zones based on 95% they'd be way too high and I'd overtrain all the time I'd always be training anaerobically when I'm trying to build my aerobic fitness and it just wouldn't work for me so for the purposes of improving your cycling performance you need to get your aerobic power aerobic power to weight as high as possible and that will improve your performance on the road for nine out of ten events yeah for nearly all the events you could possibly do on a bike if you've got the highest aerobic power in terms of what's per kilo, you'll probably perform better than other people. So actually, most people's anaerobic thresholds are slightly less than their FTP, yeah. which puts people off a little bit. When I tell them, oh, your anaerobic threshold is 270 watts, and they go, oh, but I can do 300 watts for an hour. It's, it's like, a different yes, thing. It, it's a different thing. It's a false economy, and you're making things easier for yourself if you're training with a slightly lower threshold yeah. set, right? I, I don't know why people moan about it. I'm <laughs> telling them to slow down. Yeah. Like, train easy. Like, it's fine. You will improve if you train that little Sweet bit less spot. hard. Pe Nicest thing ever. But people love going around and smashing themselves in, and they train as hard as they possibly can. And the, the number one thing that people first say to me when, when they come to me and say, oh, can you coach me? They say, I'm training really, really hard every day and I'm not getting any better. And it's really frustrating for them and I sympathise with that. But it's because they're always training anaerobically and there's a ceiling to how much you can tolerate in terms of club lactate and anaerobic work. Yeah. So they're not allowing themselves to slow down and work in those aerobic training zones that are really going to push their threshold up from underneath. So most of the time I'm saying, slow down, train easy. So, one big question. If you're not a top level athlete, is it worth buying a power meter? Yes, absolutely. I think it's more important for people who aren't a top level athlete to have a power meter because you don't have as good a feel over what efforts you can sustain for a long time. A lot of the pros, or the more traditional pros kind of shun power meters a little bit. They're like, oh, I want to race on feel. And that's because they've got a really good feel. A lot of people have a good feel. It's true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can tell. It's, it's probably easier than you think to tell because lots of different things happen as you go up through the different training zones. Like your, your breathing changes, your ability to hold a conversation changes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you, your sweat response kicks in at some point. I tell you, that's why I was so depressed when I came back to riding. I knew that I knew how unfit I was. I could tell immediately. Yeah. 
but it comes back quick. Yeah. Once you've got to a point in cycling, if you lose your fitness, it's much easier to get back to that point, um, which is why it sometimes feels a little bit controversial when ex-dopers have served their ban and come back into the pro peloton and are just as good as they were before, even though they're no longer on drugs. <laughs> they've, been, they've got up to a certain level and their body can Your tolerate body that remembers. level of fitness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even if they then start taking the drugs, they, it's probably easier for them to get back to that point without necessarily having to do it again. And that's probably a bit of a controversial viewpoint, but you know, it is what it's it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if the bands are what they are, they can only serve their band and then do it. Do what they can do, but they're playing the game. They're playing the game. Yeah, that, that's my thought. Uh, that, that's another video topic. Yeah. That's another. Yeah. 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 How many watts is she doing? <laughs> Mate, all watts. <laughs> She's gone. What is that about? She's actually gone. She just rode a horse through bag shot. So, what I was just saying regards training aerobically and anaerobically, <laughs> and tests that we did before to determine your anaerobic threshold. Once we know that, once we know what your anaerobic threshold is, that allows us to set your training zones. So there are seven different training zones um, by method, uh, conjured up by some very, very clever people, far more clever than me, who understand exactly what occurs in the body at each training zone. So as a percentage of your anaerobic threshold, what physiological adaptations the body makes. So once you know that, and um, once you know what kind of fitness improves working in each of these training zones, you can then say, right, what kind of fitness do I need for my event? I'm going to then structure my training plan to do more of these training zones that improve that particular element of fitness that I want to improve because it'll make me faster for my event. So for you, your anaerobic anero threshold was 270 watts. Was. Was. Do you think it's more than that now? Yeah. yeah. When, we, when we did that blood lactate test, for example, there's two points of interest in that test. There's the point at which you start to produce blood lactate, and then the point at which you start to produce more blood lactate than you can flush out at the same time. That second point is your anaerobic threshold. The first point is your aerobic threshold, the point at which you start to work aerobically and elicit a response. That is typically like zone three. So where you start to work hard and utilize oxygen. Um, and a lot of structured training the coaches set, it's like sweet spot zone three. It's because it gets a really good response for improving your aerobic power. Um, and, it, and it's relatively easy to recover from. You can do it on back to back days without completely knackering yourself out. So if you were training over your threshold, zone four, five every day, back to back days, eventually you would start to fatigue and the quality would drop and you wouldn't be able to complete the sessions. The horse. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? You can literally just went. <laughs> yeah. What would your be your recommendation for people who only have heart rate? Take it with a pinch of salt, or so be a bit wary. If if you only have heart rate and you don't yet have a power meter, you can go a very long way just by looking at your heart rate when you're looking at zones two, three, four. So the aerobic training zones, they're pretty solid and consistent when you look at your heart rate over long periods of time. It's once you start getting into the higher intensity bands where heart rate becomes a little bit redundant. Because there's a lag in between what your heart rate does and what your legs are doing, the heart rate struggles to catch up or speed up in time so that you can actually use it for training zones. So like, say, you, say you're doing one minute hill reps, like minute on, minute off. If you ride really hard for a minute, it might take 60 to 90 seconds for your heart rate to catch up with what your legs are doing. So if you've got a target heart rate in mind, the effort's going to be finished before you've got to your target heart rate. Go on perceived exertion or treat every effort like a maximum effort. So say I'm doing a, a session that's four by five minutes, as hard as I can go, you will probably end up doing that if you flat pace them in zone five power. Probably. If you pace it flat, then you'll probably end up in that zone. But if you go off like an absolute lunatic, you will feel by the fourth one that you started to tail off and you're not pushing yeah, as hard yeah, as you were yeah, yeah. before. So then you know you paced it wrong. Um, so feel comes a lot into it once you're doing harder efforts and anaerobic stuff. 
just just flat pace and do them as hard as you can go. And if you've got anything left in the tank at the end, empty the tank. You're so sweaty. Are you okay, mate? I'm a hot mess. We're sitting in the hottest bit. <laughs> Oh no, no. We're looking for the horse. Are you going to ride it if we find it? Yes! We seem to have stumbled on the Bagshot yearly festival thing. We, we just got told that this is the number one day in Bagshot's social calendar. I think it is! <laughs> Why don't we get one of the girls to do like a demo? We could. Two pound fifty for a horse ride. <laughs> Excuse me please, can we film you riding that horse? <laughs> what do I do? Just get on it like, get on with a horse. Oh, never got one. <laughs> she knew you were coming. Whoa. Stand up. <laughs> We keep going to see that. Yeah, oh so my god. Turn it. <laughs> it actually steers as well. It's really difficult to control. It's got a mind of its own. It's supposed to be a professional. Whoa! <laughs> I'm gonna park it. It's not great. It's easy. Yeah. yeah. Now what do I do? Up, down. Whoa. Yeah. That's it. That's good, mate. <laughs> Don't crash, mate. <laughs> it's genuinely as heavy as a horse. No, it's heavy. As a, yeah. Don't you dare edit yourself out of that. <laughs> if I watch this video and you're not riding a horse in it, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> mate, that was a zone two horse ride. Was it? Yeah. It's aerobic capacity only. <laughs> I don't think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you're allowed to race with a 36 centimetre bar. Really? I think so. These bars Maybe are interesting. Because these them. are actually 38, advertised as 38 by data, mm -hmm. but because they measure from the outside oh, instead of the inside, uh, they're okay. technically 36s. I, th I think there's a rule on track that there's a minimum bar width that you're allowed to have really? because people were making them as narrow as they could for aero gains. And like chopping and it was getting bits dangerous. off, getting yeah, silly, yeah. yeah. Strange. But I don't know if that's the same for road. Do you know, know what size Amy rides? No. 34. 34. 34 centimetre bars. Oh, yeah. And but she looks completely right on them. Really? Because they're, they're fitted properly, you know, they're just, that's how wide her shoulders are. So I just went with some aero upgrades. On the bars. Front yeah. end. Some nice thinned out aero bars from Eastern and a tri-rig front brake with the aero gains. That's insane. This is a Villier Cento 10 Air uh, with Ultegra Di2. This has got training wheels on it at the minute. These are just cheap training wheels. These are my race wheels from Bolo Cycling with some Vittoria Corsa speeds on. Set up tubeless because I always puncher. And tubeless punch. faster? Tubeless is faster and punches less. There are no pinch punchers. Um, and these tyres are really, really fast. There is nothing to pinch. Nothing. <laughs> it's just no air. pinching. Gains. Dura Ace crank set, but Altegra rear mech. Well, I'm actually putting my info crank on here now. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do that later today. Get the info crank on, um, so that I don't have to use the power tap pedals anymore. Yeah. Because power tap ones, I don't find them to be as accurate as the info crank. Not as reliable. And reliability is the number one thing you need out of a power meter. Yeah. People were sort of skeptical about what George was saying in the last video about the info crank being super super reliable really what's your take on it that's yeah. probably because he is from info crank yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which uh, which is fair enough but so as a non bias yeah well I, so I'm I'm a coach right so I coach a lot of different people and using a power meter is a really good way of measuring people's progress and performance and if a power meter is not reliable and the numbers are different day to day for the same effort, it almost renders the power meter redundant. Because it's one job is to be consistent day to yeah. day. And I've seen lots of pedal based options that are great for a little while. And then they start to deteriorate over time yeah. and give really funny readings. And it puts people off from a motivation perspective, because if their power meter is reading low, they think they're not getting fitter when they might actually be getting fitter. Do and also, if I test them on my Watt bike and set their training zones and they get very different readings on their own power meter, their training's off. So we have to like calibrate my Watt bike against their power meter and I like, do all sorts of stuff. So the number one thing I want out of a power meter as a coach is reliability. And InfoCrank is the most reliable power meter I've ever used. It's brilliant. I've used it all winter. It's the it's on my TT bike and it will be on my race bike. It's been on my training bike all winter. And it's just for, for me, 
it's the number one parameter for consistency accuracy. Better than SRM? I've never used an SRM, so I can't comment. Um, but I think half if, the price of an SRM, if it cranks like half the price of yeah. SRM, so and e you can replace the battery yourself. This is what I was trying to say. It's you know, can you not replace battery? No, SRM, SRM, you have to send it back to SRM. What, yeah, that's a pain in the ass. And if it's crank based, it means you can use aero pedals. Another game, aero pedals. So you think it's a speed play, but then pin, please, oh. dimply pin, please. Kenny Boom Boom. Right, I've got to go. It's been a pleasure. We're not going to do a thing. There's been none of those things in your videos for ages. Like a. What pressure's on? Oh, that's it. Yeah. Lovely to catch up with Ken. Now back to the house. Time to get ready for this wedding. It's extremely hot today. Extremely hot. You can probably tell by how sweaty I am. She wanna ride for me. Hey, say she wanna.